sorry. We're not going to have piano accompaniment today. We'll pray for <coughs> Carol to feel better. You know, I know this. I've, I've known her for a while, and she would have to be pretty ill not to play the piano <coughs> on a Sunday. So keep her in your prayers. Um, but she's a strong lady. I'm sure she's going to be okay. Um, let's sing a cappella. Let's stand together and sing hymn number 188 in your hymnals. This is one that probably most of you know. Hymn number 188. Let's sing. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there have I, as vile as he, washed all my sins away, washed all my sins away, washed all my sins away. And there may I, though vile as he, washed all my sins away. Ere since by faith I saw the stream Thy flowing wounds supply Redeeming love has been my theme And shall be till I die And shall be till I die And shall be till I die Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose his power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more, be saved to sin no more, till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Amen. Our text this morning is John's Gospel, chapter 3. We're going to finish chapter 3 today. John chapter 3, verses 31 to 36. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard of that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. 
But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, our sublime text today continues where we left, left off last week with John the Baptist delivering his message to his disciples who had come to him and told him that Jesus was gaining followers and baptizing. And it almost seems from the context that John's disciples were a little bit maybe perturbed by this. Is John going to be upset about the fact that Jesus is gaining disciples and ostensibly John's following is becoming less? No. John's reaction to that is to say, he must become greater, I must decrease, I must become less. And then John gave this great explanation of how he really feels at hearing the voice of the bridegroom in verse 29. He says, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. That's Jesus. Jesus is the bridegroom. The bride is the church. The church is coming to Jesus. So the church belongs to Jesus. Actually, you know what? Let me just pause for a split second and say something just because I can. The church is Jesus' church. She is his bride. The church belongs to him. It's not mine. It's not Calvin's. It's not even yours. It's Jesus' church. The bride belongs to him. And John knew that acutely. Understanding that the church is Jesus' church is actually, it's a freeing thing to know, ah, then if I'm a part of the church, I can serve it knowing that I'm serving my master. I belong to him. Even, you know, what happens sometimes, and thankfully, um, probably most people who are attendees or members of a church who are not in the leadership of the church maybe don't always realize that um, there are times when people will go and be a part of a church for 30, 40, 50 years or so on, and they, there are some, sometimes church members who tend to think, this is mine, and I want the leadership to do what I want them to do, and they hold on to it um, with an iron grip. That can be hard on pastors. That can be really hard. But when we take this view that John the Baptist has, that, ah, it's okay that these people are going to Jesus because they belong to him. They don't belong to me. Ah, how freeing it is. Then, then of course, I want to obey Christ and do what he calls his church to do but uh, and, and have ownership only in the sense of, you know, I care about the body of Christ. But I don't have to think that I, that I own it. I don't own it. Um, so that's, that was John's thought. He says, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. But then look further. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy is, of mine has been made full. That's what John the Baptist says. That he's a friend of Jesus. That he's joyful at hearing the voice of Jesus. And he says, he must increase, but I must decrease. All right. Then we come to the text that we see today. John goes on. He says, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard, of that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. All right. So look at what it says. He who comes from above is above all. From where does Christ descend? He descends from heaven. He comes down from heaven. Heaven is, in a sense, above 
the earth. I mean, proximally, it is above the earth. Jesus ascends into heaven in Acts chapter 1. Heaven, uh, this might strike you as odd or strange. I don't think it should, though. Heaven is a place. <laughs> All right, I know. I know that might seem like, oh, what do you mean? Well, Jesus went someplace. He is in a place right now. Now, there's a sense in which he's always with us, but he's with us through the indwelling Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. The physical person of Jesus Christ, right now, we know where he is. You know where he is? He's sitting at the right hand of his Father in heaven. That's where he is. When Stephen dies, when he's stoned to death in Acts chapter 7, he looks up, the heavens open. He sees Jesus standing, ready to receive him. So God gives him a glimpse of where Jesus is. He looks upward. Heaven is above. It is a place. I don't know where it is. Past Saturn, I don't, I don't know where it is, all right? But it is a place. And as another side note, this reality that heaven is an actual place and that Jesus is physically there right now is truly the antidote to, like, transubstantiation in the Catholic Church, which states that the physical body and blood of Jesus, actually the bread and the wine, become the physical, actual body of Christ. No, this denies Christ's literal, actual humanity. He's not in the bread and the wine physically. How do I know that? Because I know where he is physically. And when he comes back again, it's not going to be on an altar. It's going to be on the clouds of heaven. He's going to ride a white horse. And he's going to come back on the clouds of heaven. In the same way that he ascended into heaven, he's going to come back from heaven. He will descend on the clouds. So heaven is above. Heaven is above. I know that that might seem elementary to us, but perhaps it's just something that we don't think about very much. That it is a place, that it is above. Revelation 21, 2. And I, John, this is the same John who writes John's gospel. John says, and I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So the imagery given in the Bible of heaven's proximity to earth, as it were, is that heaven is above. Heaven is above. Look at what our text says in verse 31. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. Now, before we get to the second part about earth, Heaven is also above the earth in another sense. It is greater than the earth. Heaven is greater in many respects than the earth. It is not tainted with sin or sin's curse. The saints who are there are called the spirits of the righteous made perfect. That's Hebrews chapter 12. If they were not made perfect, they could not enter into heaven. Flesh and blood cannot enter into heaven. Why? Because our flesh and blood is stained with sin. That's the reason why, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, uh, we must slough off the mortal coil, right? Uh, death, in a sense, the, the, the physical death of this body of sin is a necessary prerequisite to entrance into heaven. Even when Christ returns and we are changed, if, hey, I pray, I hope that that happens in our lifetime, in the lifetime of all of you who are sitting here right now, that Jesus would return and that the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise 
that we will be changed. But even that change is something akin to the death of the body. It's not death of the body, but it's akin to the death of the body. The body must change in order for it to be fit for heaven. We have a, a natural body. What God is preparing for us is a spiritual body. Spiritual body. It seems like a, almost an oxymoron because spirit is spirit. Body is corporal. So what does spiritual body mean? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But I know this. It's different from the kind of body that we have right now. It's like Jesus' glorified body. Jesus could do things in his glorified body that normal bodies are not able to do. I.e., he ascends into heaven. He walks through doors. I don't know. His body was glorified and different after the resurrection then it was still the same person and still, in a sense, the same body, but it's glorified body. Um, so those who are from above, those who are in the heaven above, um, they're made perfect. They are glorified. Um, and they are above Heaven itself is above the comprehension of the earth's inhabitants. No mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. We cannot even imagine it. And it makes sense that we couldn't imagine what heaven really is like other than what the Bible says about it. That it is a world of peace and joy. That there's no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Okay? But the reality is, even knowing those things... Our minds are so dim to the realities of heaven. They're so dim. They're so dull. Because I don't know what it's like to experience life without pain. Do you? <laughs> no. As soon as we're born into the world, we have pain, loss, suffering, sorrow. But there, there, there are none of those things. Wow. Mm. I think that as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we should have a yearning for heaven, a taste for heaven, to be with Jesus in heaven. I think that preachers don't talk enough about heaven. Heaven is the place where Paul says, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Oh, how tethered we are to this world. You know, we do anything we can to put our anti-aging cream or our, you know, uh, 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 health food and all, all of that. Just, just to extend as much as we can, just extend a little bit more time. I just want a little more time on this wretched ball of sin called the earth. Like, really, though, if we think about it, if we're, if we're Christians, I don't know. Maybe that's the wrong approach, you know? Maybe that's the wrong approach. Maybe, as, you know, our, we look at ourselves in the mirror and we see our wrinkles and we see our hair thinning, Maybe we should look at those things as signs of getting closer to the day when we see Jesus face to face. Instead of being upset about them, instead of trying to stop them and reverse them. Oh, reverse? To reverse means I have to wait longer to see Jesus. To reverse means I have to, you know, spend more time in this world. I'd rather... Be with the one who is from above, right? All right. All right. So, so listen to what John says. He who comes from, from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. Man is naturally of the earth and from the earth. Genesis 2, 7 tells us, that God formed man from the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Therefore, we can in our natural state only know and speak of the natural 
world. You see, that's why for as valuable as science is, and science is valuable, there are certainly things, all science should be at its core is inquiry into the natural world. There's nothing wrong with inquiry into the natural world. How do things work? How does God's creation work? You know, those who say Christians are against science, they don't really know history because it's Christians who have always been the scientists. They're, they're the ones who developed scientific inquiry. How do we view creation, you know? And now, of course, only in the last couple of centuries has that really been turned on its head and, and so-called scientists now think that they're, uh, that they're wiser than God, that they know more about the nature of reality than God does. But, so, as I was saying, science is important and valuable. Scientific inquiry is limited to nature and fallen nature at its best. Man can speak. I mean, naturally, we can speak quite dimly and dully on things like biology and chemistry and geology and physics and the like. But when it comes to spiritual reality, the natural man is utterly as blind as a bat. That's the reason why I was talking to uh, the congregation in the morning of the church where I pastor about this. And what I said to them was, the Apostle Paul in uh in Romans. Actually, just keep your finger here. Turn, turn to the book of Romans, because I, I saw this today, and it, and it was so, so striking to me. Romans chapter 1. It was so striking to me, I, I just have to say it. Um, Romans chapter 1 and verse 14. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul writes this. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. I thought, man, that's a really fascinating thing for Paul to say. He's under obligation. Obligation for what? Well, obligation to preach, right? To preach the gospel to them. Both to Greeks and barbarians, to the wise and to the foolish. The Greeks always looked at themselves as being the wise. They have philosophy. They have people like Aristotle and Plato and all of them. We're the wise ones. We're the philosophers. Paul says, I'm under obligation to preach the gospel to you. And to the barbarians, too. <laughs> to the fighters. To the ones who eventually came and sacked Rome He's under obligation to both. Why? Because even the wisest Greek in a worldly sense is utterly dull and dim when it comes to the things of God. We as Christians, even the dullest Christian, okay, the dullest Christian, the one who trusts in Jesus Christ and they don't know much more than that, they just believe in Jesus and what he's done. That person can go to the smartest atheist in the whole world and share the gospel with that person and teach them something that they're, that, that so-called smart person is just utterly ignorant about. We never have to be afraid uh, to go to anybody with the gospel because... Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And they worshipped the natural things rather than the Creator, who is to be forever praised. Amen. Amen. So, man can only speak of the earth. We can only um, understand naturally the things of the earth. And the things of the earth can sometimes be discerned by observation. While that's the case about the things of earth, the things of heaven can only be discerned by revelation. Earth can be discerned by observation. Heaven can only be discerned by revelation. It takes 
Jesus the Holy and the Holy Spirit to reveal to us spiritual truths. That revelation is given to us in the person and work of Christ through the illumination of the Holy Spirit. I was talking with a man named Tom Pennington the other day and he gave this wonderful illustration. He said, imagine that you're walking into a cathedral at nighttime. And you look and see on the sides of the cathedral, there are, there's this beautiful stained glass. You can kind of make it out, but it's nighttime. The lights are off. You can just see, like, there is something. I think that's stained glass up there. But then, if you go back the next day, in the light of the morning, and the light is streaming from the sun through the windows. Ah, then you can see the picture. You can see what's actually there. That's what the illumination of the Holy Spirit is like in the life of the Christian. He reveals to us who God is. Let's look again at the text. He who comes from heaven is above or comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. He said it twice for emphasis. Jesus has all authority. He is above every person. There is no one on the earth who even compares to Jesus. Not even John the Baptist compares to Jesus. There's no one in history who compares to Jesus because there's only one man who is the man from heaven. Everyone else is of the earth and from the earth. The man from heaven reveals to us the things of heaven. And John tells us that the man from heaven is above all. He's the king of heaven and earth. He's above all in his honor. He is above all in his worthiness of praise. He is above all in his power, in his wisdom, in his goodness, in his holiness, in his righteousness. He's above all in his knowledge. He knows all things. He knows your heart. He knows your mind. He knows history. He knows the future. He knows everything. He's above all. He is above all in his authority. He has authority over Everything and everyone. There's not a rogue molecule in the whole universe. He has authority over the molecules in your body. He has authority over everything that ever happens. Jesus is above all. He's above all. Hallelujah. That we belong to Him. We belong to Him. We can talk to Him. He knows us. He hears us. He communes with us. Oh, how many want to be friends with the great men of earth, the, the, the powerful men. Oh, how many want to be friends with the Elon Musks or the, or the Brad Pitts of the world. How many want to surround themselves with such people, but they are dust. They're dust. We get to know Jesus. He is above all. And yet, though he is all these things, he's above all in all of these qualities and so many more. When he testifies, John says no one receives his testimony. How utterly foolish is man that he will receive the testimony of sinners before he receives the testimony of the Son of God. John the Baptist then tells us this astounding fact about man's reception of Christ's revelation. What he has seen and heard, of that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. Why don't the people receive the testimony of Jesus as he speaks about what he has seen and what he has her. What's the reason for it? Well, the scripture already told us, Jesus already told Nicodemus earlier on in this chapter, why people don't receive him. Because men love darkness rather than light. Their deeds are evil. That's the reason why. They don't receive him. They don't receive his testimony, not because what he says isn't true, 
They don't receive his testimony because what he says is true. And man loves falsehood more than the truth. Man loves darkness rather than light. This is our fundamental problem. That's it. Really, that's it. Christ tells us to love our enemy. And what do we want? We naturally hate our enemy. Christ tells us to deny ourselves. And what do we do? We want to indulge ourselves. Christ tells us that he is the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. And we want to find any other way to the Father except Jesus Christ. Right? Man. This is man's natural reaction to the Lord. I think Frank Sinatra can say it better than me. For what is a man? What has he got? If not himself, then he has not. To say the things he truly feels and not the words of one who kneels. The record shows I took the blows and did it my way. Wow! That is the anthem of fallen man. Frank Sinatra gave us fallen man's anthem throughout history. Man wants to say the things he truly feels and not the words of one who kneels. Wow, that's so... It's so crazy. It's so, it's so honest. In, in a lot of ways, it's, it's like so honest. I did it my way. Look at the very last verse of the book of Judges. There was no king in the land, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. Those are bad times for Israel. <laughs> really, really bad. But that's just a snapshot, not just of Israel, but of all mankind. All of mankind wants to do what is right in his own eyes instead of what's right in God's. Romans 3, 9 to 18 gives us the verdict. And the Apostle Paul puts it this way. What then? Are we any better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There's none who understands. There's none who seek for God. All have turned aside. Together they become useless. There's none who does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's the diagnosis. That's what the apostle says. So then, oh, is all hope lost? Is all hope lost? God could have very well turned his back upon mankind. Luther, who was not God, thankfully, Luther said this, if I was God, I would have destroyed the world twice after breakfast. I understand that sentiment. If you, if you see the way that the, this broken, fallen, messed up world is, if you see it, I mean, it, then really then the flood makes more sense, doesn't it? Noah's flood makes more sense. When I visited with Martin, I visited the ark that they built down in Kentucky. It's really cool. If you've never been there, you guys should go. I mean, we could take a little field trip and go again. Um, and they have this little section in the ark, and it's... It's about all these children's books that are like real cute, cutesy books on the flood. And like, oh, the cute little animals getting onto a boat. And, and Ken Ham specifically put this, all these books together 
to tell people, mm, the account of the flood is not a cutesy kind of a, uh, an account. This is the judgment of God on the earth. The judgment of God. And, and it is uh, something that we can thank God that but for the remnant of eight people that God spared, Noah and his family, outside of that, well, we wouldn't exist right now, thousands of years later. We wouldn't be here in this place. And we can all, all of us, listen, we can all of us trace our family lineage back to an act of judgment on the earth. All of us can trace our family lineage back to that. All of us come from Noah's family, you know. It's sobering to think about that. And God promises that he'll never send a flood on the earth again, but he also promises that he's going to send fire. All hope could be lost, and rightly so. He could have destroyed the world with a word from his mouth, but he doesn't. Instead, what God does is he chooses a remnant by grace. He chooses a remnant to believe on the Lord Jesus. Listen to what John goes on to say in verse 33. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Now, think about this. If you're paying attention to the message so far, it would seem like verse 33 is a direct contradiction to verse 32. Look at verse 32 again. John 3, verse 32. What he has seen and heard, of that he testifies. And no one receives his, look at this, no one receives his testimony. Verse 33. He who has received his testimony has set a seal to this. It's like, wait a second. <laughs> I thought you just said, no one has received his testimony. So then what do you mean when you say, he who has received it? What does John the Baptist mean here? What's he saying? Well, Notice that throughout this sermon, I've used the words, the natural man, a number of times. The natural man. What the natural man means is, uh, I use it to differentiate between what we are by nature in this world and what we who were given the new birth by the Spirit have become. In other words... This is the juxtaposition. By nature, I'm under the wrath of God. By nature, I hate God and all the things of God, including the words of God, the commands of God. I don't want to follow God. By nature, I don't love God. It's only when God the Holy Spirit takes out the heart of stone and gives the heart of flesh. It's only when he renews my spirit, creates a new man, that the old man is dead, the new man has come, then may I receive the words of Christ. Only then. Only then. That's the reason why this chapter of John's Gospel, John chapter 3, is so utterly crucial and necessary to the Christian life. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And as we looked at that a few weeks ago, we saw that the first verse says he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And then two verses later it says he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And what it means is this, that outside of this regenerating work of the Holy Spirit inside of our hearts, outside of that, I'm blind to it. I can't see it. Not only am I blind to it, I'm dead to it. Not only am I dead to it, I'm inclined against it. I'm inclined against God. I'm inclined against His Word. I don't want Him. I want to be my own God. <clears throat> I 
And this reality is given to us in the scripture over and over and over. It's the first temptation that Satan gives to Eve. God knows that when you eat of this tree, you will become like him, knowing good and evil. And she does so because she wants to be her own god. She wants to be her own goddess. Adam does so because he wants to be his own god. He wants to determine right and wrong for himself. And the result of that has been catastrophic. What it has resulted in is this. Every man does what's right in his own eyes. This, like I like to put it this way. For my whole life, I, until Christ saved me, I always looked at this existence as my movie. All right, think about that. I look at it as my movie. This is about me, man. This whole existence in the world is all about me. You know how I know that? Because I see through these eyes. That's how. I see through these eyes. Therefore, the story is mine. It's me. It's about me. My experience is the thing that matters the most. Not what other people think. What I think. I am the arbiter of truth. I am the one who knows what's right and what's wrong. I'm smarter than anybody else. I want to do what I want to do. Why? Because I want to do it. This is my movie. This whole saga, it's all the story of David Lovey. Now, you might think, wow, what a, a narcissistic thing for someone to say. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Even the story of Narcissus, the Greek story of Narcissus, is about a man who falls in love with himself. And looking in his own reflection, he falls in love with himself, right? So he thinks that the whole story is about him. And even though they didn't understand spiritual reality, that that is a result of the fall of man. That is a result of Adam and Eve eating from the tree of which God commanded them not to eat. Yet they were, could observe this reality is actually true about each of us. That each of us see the world through our own eyes and we naturally think, this is about me. This is my story. I'm going to do what's good for me. It's only when the Holy Spirit illuminates us that we're able to see this has nothing to do with me at all. At all! Nothing! This is God's story. This is God's world. This is God's church. This is God's reality. Like, that's the reason why... Count Zinzendorf could honestly say, let me preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. He could honestly say that, preach that, because he realized, hey, Count Zinzendorf, which probably I don't know how many of you even know who that was before I just said the name. He realized, wow, oh, you know, I am all unrighteousness. I have nothing. Nothing in my hands I bring simply to thy cross I cling. That's it. It doesn't matter whether I'm remembered or not. It really doesn't. How many of you know the names of your great, great, great grandparents? Three. Just three. Three generations, I mean. How many of you know the names of your great-great-great-grandparents? They're born in the 1800s, maybe the mid to early 1800s. None, no one? Uh, I don't either. I don't either. And should the Lord tarry, my great-great-great-grandchildren, they're not going to remember me either. <laughs> they're not. But that's okay. That's okay, because this actually isn't my story like I thought it was, like I deceived myself into thinking that it was. It's not about me. 
It's about Christ. This reality is all about Christ. And there's only ever one reason that we or anyone ever receives and believes these things. If we ever receive or believe in the testimony of Jesus Christ, it is because the text says he has given the spirit without measure. The spirit sent by the father and the son gives us the illumination necessary to receive Jesus Christ. When Peter confessed, Jesus said, who do you say I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed these things to you, but your father who is in heaven. So when John says this, he who has received his testimony has set his seal to this. This reality takes away any pride that I might have in receiving the testimony of Jesus. Because even the reception, grace is so much, or God's salvation is so much a gift of grace. Listen now, that even the ability to receive the gift is a part of the gift. Even the ability to receive the gift of Christ is a part of the gift of Christ. Because outside of that, I don't have the ability to receive it. I don't have the ability to even comprehend it. I don't have the ability nor the desire to even want it. But it's so full of grace that when he gives this gift of salvation, he also gives the desire, the new heart, the change of will, to receive it, the ability to believe in it, the ability then to say, ah, I, perhaps someone has read the Bible before, read things in the Bible, and it's just like, blah, 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 blah. And then suddenly the Spirit comes in and changes them. <gasps> and then it's like, I can't believe it. How was I reading all these things before and they meant nothing to me and now they are more valuable. This word of God is more valuable than all the treasure of Egypt. It's all because of God's grace to us. Oh, blessed are we when we believe in Christ because the way that Peter was given this knowledge is the same way that we are given this knowledge and this ability to receive Christ. Very well. So then from the context, no one naturally receives Christ's testimony about himself. But for those who are given the Holy Spirit, who receive his testimony, we proclaim, look at what the text says, we proclaim that God is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. Today we hear so much about my truth. Why don't you tell me your truth? Uh, what's your truth, right? What's my truth? And we almost hear nothing about God's truth. But friends, I stand here before you today to set my seal to this, that God is true. God is true. His words are the words of truth. And what is the application of this truth then today? Look at the next two verses, the very end of John chapter 3, verse 35 to 36. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand, even the authority to bestow eternal life on all who believe in him. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. What marvelous truth this is. It is not the one who works the hardest that has eternal life. It's not the one who strives the most, but he who believes in the Son. What a simple, profound, magnificent reality this is. By looking on the pierced one, we may possess eternal life full of glory. This is what God who cannot lie tells us. Look at, it says in the last verse, it says, He who receives his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. God is true. 
It means that everything that he says is true. It's never false. It's always true. That's how you can know that so-called modern prophets today aren't really prophets. Because what they say is not true. It's not true. How many of them prophesied, Donald Trump is going to be the next president again. He's going to get reelected. All those prophets should, well, if they lived in the Old Testament times, they would have been stoned to death. They would have all been counted as false prophets. Do not be afraid of them. False prophets. Everything that God says is true. So that when God says in his word to you right now, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. Those are true words. Truer? Truer than anything else. If you believe in Jesus, you have eternal life. That word has, he who believes has, is in the Greek a present indicative active verb. It means to have, to hold, to possess. It means that if you believe in Jesus, eternal life is already yours. It's already yours. It's not something that we as Christians shall gain in the future. This is an important thing for us. I'm, I'm, I'm almost finished. I, I think we need to realize this. Eternal life culminates in the future. There's a culmination of our e eternal life in that uh, we will, we who believe in Christ will have new bodies and they will not be subject to the curse and it will be so wonderful. But that's not when eternal life begins. Eternal life begins the moment one trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation. That is when their eternal life begins. That's why John says, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. A present indicative active verb. To have, to hold, to possess. You possess it. You have eternal life. Do you believe in Jesus? If you believe in Jesus, if you trust in him alone for your salvation, if you believe that you have no righteousness in yourself, that you are wholly dependent upon the mercy and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you believe that that's true, you trust in him, you give you, your eternal destiny into his hands, then you can say truly and without any pride at all, I have eternal life. If you have something which is eternal, then by definition, you cannot lose it. If you could lose it, it would be conditional life. It would be temporary life. It would be potential life. Well, potentially, I will have eternal life in the future. That's not what the text says. The text says this present indicative active verb. He who believes has eternal life right now. Oh, this should cause the believer to say thank you God so much. Thank you so much. It's not presumption to say I have eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Catholic Catechism says to say such a thing, to say I have assurance of eternal life, if a person says that, that that's a, a blasphemous, heresy, terrible. But what does the Bible say? Not the Catholic Catechism. What does the Bible say? First John 5, 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. That's assurance. That's the assurance of our salvation. And this is the gospel. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. This is the power to dispel the fear of death and the grave. I mean, doesn't it, friend? Doesn't this truth have the power to dispel the fear of death? 
What can the world do to me? This is why Jesus said, fear not man who can kill the body and do nothing else. Like, so what? Ah, but pastor, you just said kill the body. So what do you mean you have eternal life if your body can be killed? I'll get to that in just a moment. Suffice it to say this, Satan, hell, the world, or any man can do nothing to me. I have eternal life in Christ. This is what Jesus means when he says in John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? This is what he said to Martha. And Martha said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the son of a living God. I believe. And then Jesus goes to the tomb and he tells them to roll away the stone. Oh no, Lord, if you roll away the stone, there will be a great stench, for he's been in the grave for four days. And Jesus says to her, did I not tell you? Did I not tell you that if you believe you would see this, this beautiful, miraculous thing that he's about to do? Christ then says, Lazarus, come on! And the dead man comes out. So what does he mean when he says, on the resurrection and the life, he who believes in me will live even though he dies? What it means is this. To the Christian, a departure from this world is not the end of life. It is the continuance of greater life. That's why the Christian can say with Paul, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Eternal life begins in the moment one trusts in Jesus. It continues even through the sloughing off of the mortal coil. And it culminates in the final resurrection of the body at the last day. All of those are still part of eternal life. If you believe in Jesus, you can have this assurance. You can know but you have it. This is the assurance we have. The Christian ought never to say, I don't know if I have eternal life or I don't. The Christian should not say that. John tells us that we who believe may know that we have it. Hallelujah. But look at the second half of verse 36 and I'll finish with this. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. For the one who does not obey the Son's command to believe, he will not only die, but then after death, he will face another kind of culmination, the culmination of God's wrath upon him. A wrath which, as the text says, already abides on him. Look at verse 36 again. He who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. In other words, the wrath of God already is abiding on such a person. This is at least part of the reason why we believe that the Greek word hilasterion should be translated as propitiation. Propitiation means this, that Christ quells the wrath of God on our behalf. 1 John 4, 10 to 11. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the hilasterion for our sins, as the propitiation for our sins. Why do we need a propitiation? Because of what this verse says. He who does not obey the son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That's the reason why we need propitiation. That's the reason why Jesus needs to quell the wrath of God on our behalf. That's the reason why when he dies on the cross, right before his death, he says this, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Why does he say it? Because he is taking this wrath of God upon himself on our behalf. He does it for us. He is the penal substitutionary atonement. The judgment of God, the wrath of God Almighty on sin is poured out on Christ for 
us. Not just the sins which I have committed, even the sins which I shall still commit. All the punishment for that is poured out on him. He takes it for me. You see why Jesus is worthy of worship? Amen. He really is. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our adoration, our obedience to him. He's worthy of our following him no matter what the world does. Even if the whole world turns against Christ, I will pray to God, let me never turn away from you. You're my only hope. Uh, Christ is the greatest gift to mankind. He really is. That's why John and Peter see the man at the gate called Beautiful, who's begging, and they say to him, Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, get up and walk. The man gets up and walks. It's this wonderful miracle that the apostles do. They gave him the gift of Christ. The gift of Christ is even greater than the gift of walking. Christ is the greatest gift to mankind. He's the greatest person. There's a person which is the object of our worship, and it's Jesus Christ. I know, I know some of these things might seem elementary that I'm saying that, that are so, like, maybe we just take them for granted. Maybe I do. I don't want to speak for anybody else. Maybe I take him for granted sometimes. I never want to. Maybe I do. Never want to take Christ for granted. I always want to see his worth and his value and his love and what he's done for me. I was under the wrath of God, wrath which would have otherwise lasted for all eternity. I was already under it, already. I was finished with this. Just listen to this. It's what Jonathan Edwards was trying to convey in his sermon, The Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Is what he's saying is this, is that God is under no obligation to uphold rebels. He's under no obligation to do so. And, and therefore, we must seek the Lord while he may be found. Go to him, cry out to him, ask him, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy. I don't have any goodness to commend myself to you. There is no reason why you should receive me, but I'm asking you based on who you are, your mercy, your love. I've seen you show mercy to others. I'm asking you, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me now. Have mercy on me. Have you done so? Have you cried out to Christ? I asked him, Lord, take this wrath from me. I cannot bear it. As Christian did in Pilgrim's Progress, as the evangelist comes to Christian and he says to him, why are you not willing to die? And Christian says, because I have this burden upon my back and I fear that if I die, this burden will sink me lower than the grave. That's the reason why. Ultimately, that's the reason why everyone is afraid to die. Fear has to do with judgment. Perfect love casts out fear. Do you see that? Fear has to do with judgment. So that if I carry this burden, this weight of sin upon my shoulders, I should be afraid. I should be afraid that this is going to sink me down past the grave into hell forever. Until I come to Christ and he takes the burden from off of my shoulders and it rolls off and it disappears into the sepulcher never to be seen again. That's why the apostle writes in Romans 6, therefore reckon yourselves dead to sin and alive to Christ. It's as simple as that. Outside of the author of life, there is no life. A person cannot be saved until they comprehend their need for their salvation. And that's the reason why this message, the wrath of God, just finish, I'll say this. This message of the, the wrath of God is not a popular message, right? It's not something that people want to hear. John the Baptist 
was beheaded for this message. I mean, ultimately, he calls out Herod for sleeping with his brother's wife. But what's he calling him out for? He's calling him out for sin. He's telling him, you are sinning against God. And Herod did not want to hear that. So he locks him up in jail and cuts his head off. Yet, John the Baptist is the friend of the bridegroom. He's the friend of the author of life. He has eternal life in Christ, the one whom he loves. And so ultimately, he's there right now in, in heaven uh, rejoicing. And he has been for the last 2,000 years. Amen. Amen. Thank God for this message from John's third chapter. Let's pray. Ask the Lord to give us gratefulness in our hearts and minds for what he has done for us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your love and mercy and grace to us. Thank you that you took the wrath that I rightly deserve. I was under the wrath of God. I was without hope and without God in the world. But Jesus Christ came and bore it all. And because of that, I can gratefully say I have eternal life in Jesus. I possess it. It cannot be taken away because it is a gift from you. It is all of you, solely Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. We thank you. We praise you. Our great King, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'd like to stand and sing hymn number 178. <clears throat> 178. Oh, sacred head now wounded. We'll sing a cappella. Oh, sacred head now wounded, with grief and shame weighed down, now scornfully surrounded with thorns thine only crown. Oh, sacred head, what glory, what bliss till now was thine. Yet thou despised and gory, I joy to call thee mine. What thou, my Lord, hast suffered was all for sinners' gain. Mine, mine was the transgression, but thine the deadly pain. Lo, here I fall, my Savior, tis I deserve thy place. Look on me with thy favor, vouchsafe me to thy grace. What language shall I borrow to thank thee, dearest friend, for this thy dying sorrow, thy pity without end? Oh, make me thine forever, and should I fainting be, Lord, let me never, never outlive my love to Thee. Be near when I am dying, oh, show Thy cross to me, and for my succor flying, Come, Lord, to set me free. These eyes, new faith receiving, 
from Jesus shall not move. For he who dies believing, dies safely through thy love. Amen. Amen. And now may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in everything good to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. And all of God's people said, Amen! Amen. Amen. May God be with you all.